Good morning, everybody. Good to see you here. It's good to hello to everyone at home there. Um, uh, how's your 2021 going so far? I say it a little bit tongue in cheek. It's been a bit of a rough week. Um, even as I was preparing the sermon this week, you know, a lot of things going on in our nation right now. I got very heavy hearted. I'm a little bit more encouraged here being with you right now. Uh, but if you don't mind, uh, just as we pray to get into God's word, let's also uh, take a minute and pray for our nation as well. So let's pray. Uh, Yahweh, our Lord, uh, you are king over the heavens, king over the earth, and you are eternal. So we, we just come before you and, and acknowledge you. Um, Lord, uh, you know uh, the craziness going on in our country, uh, the division, the hearts that are broken, the people who don't yet know you. And uh, we pray, uh, help us, help this nation, uh, not just to um, get over division and, and to get rid of the venom, but for people to be saved, for people to know you, for you to be glorified. Uh, help our hearts in this time and help us to lift our eyes up to you uh, to just rest where you are king. Um, you're king over the nations. You're king over us as well. Bless our time in your word and really speak to our hearts, Holy Spirit. Help us to see what's in Isaiah uh, where we can live for you, for your glory, Jesus. Amen. All right. Um, I want to start out this morning by telling just a little story from my past. I, as I get older, I'm fonder and fonder thinking of my youth. Uh, but I want to talk about uh, a time in my life. It was about a year before I became a Christian. I was 18 back then. I was a freshman in college. If you can imagine it, I had the flop of the flock of seagulls haircut dangling down in front of my eyes. And I was the typical Gen Xer, uh, living my life for whatever, uh, not quite knowing what that was, uh, and feeling pretty lost in the world. And uh, as I was working through my freshman year at college, God got my attention through a very unlikely candidate. Uh, this was another guy who was not a Christian. He was actually uh, kind of a young-ish British literature professor at my school. Uh, he was young, he partied with the students, he listened to Sonic Youth, so I figured he had to be okay. Uh, and he got my attention one day in class. Uh, this is way back in the day of analog blackboards and chalk, if you can imagine this. So he had this chalkboard behind him. And he was just explaining to all of us there, he realized that none of us really had any background with Christianity. And he wasn't a Christian either, but he says, well, to understand the literature we're about to read, you need to understand a little bit about Christian history. And he says, do you understand that Christian, the Christian view of history is different from other religions and other worldviews? And then he took his stick of chalk and he kind of just very lazily started drawing this kind of curvy loop that kind of went up and down and back upon itself, no direction, no meaning. He says, this is how most other religions and worldviews see history. No beginning, no end, no direction, no meaning. Just kind of this endless, meaningless loop throughout time. And he says, in contrast to that, here's Christianity. He started drawing straight lines. He says, it's a story with the beginning, middle, and end. God creates mankind. They fall. Things go up and down. The Savior rescues them, and they're reunited with God. It's a story with the beginning, middle, and an end. It's a worldview that has a destination. And uh, <laughs> that caught my attention. Because uh, I felt, as a typical Gen Xer, I had bought into the, we don't know where we come from, we don't know where we're going, and anything in between is meaningless. And for me to see that there was another option out there, it was that seed that God used to start drawing me to him a year before I even became a Christian. And um, it was like water to someone who's dying of thirst. And the reason why I give you this illustration as we just kind of start out our talk here uh, is I think that for us as Christians, we have good reason to have hope. We can see the story that has a destination, and we're part of that story. But sometimes I think, and myself included, that we still feel like we're on this slow, never-ending spiral with no meaning, no purpose, no beginning, and no word that we're going of any meaning. Um, we get frustrated with work. 
We get frustrated maybe with relationships or politics or social media or a million other things. And we're so focused right here on the narrow thing right in front of us in the fog of war that we forget that there is a bigger picture out here with a history that's going somewhere. But if we focus down here in the fog of war, we can lose hope. We can get stressed and we might even make some poor decisions. But the good news is we have a cure for this as Christians to lift us out of the fog of war. And that's just to remind ourselves of the big picture of where God is directing human history for his glory. And that's what we're going to do today as we wrap up the book of Isaiah. We're going to break through the clouds of our day-to-day and week-to-week, and we're going to look at the big picture of what God's doing in history according to Isaiah. And kind of the key question that I'll use to guide us along here is, well, how does the story end? Or if you want to put it in other terms, to what destination is God bringing human history? And once we figure that out, we're going to have some important things that apply to our lives, like how do we think, how should we act when we're down here in the fog of war? Uh, and that bigger picture of what God is doing is going to help us with that. So uh, if you got your Bibles, you can bring them out here. We're going to be at the end of the book of Isaiah, the final five chapters. Now, uh, if you've been with us in our series for a while, it's been a hard road. It's been a fun road, uh, and it's a lot to cover here. Last week, Eric said that these final five chapters are going to give us, as believers, a glimpse of things to come. And that's absolutely true. But don't be fooled. That doesn't mean that it's going to be a Hollywood ending where the cowboy rides off into the sunset. The uh, book of Isaiah doesn't end in this cotton candy hug between heaven and earth. I mean, granted, there is some amazing stuff that will blow our minds and capture our heart's attention, but there's also some really gritty stuff that will probably make us feel uneasy down to the very last verse of the book. It's both. It's good and it's gritty. And I think that that's just the nature of the, of the book of Isaiah because it deals with both judgment and comfort. Uh, and these two layers of judgment and comfort if I can use this picture here, they're kind of mixed together, swirled together like layers of a finely made croissant, right? And um, since we have so much to cover in these chapters, I'm going to do violence to the croissant, okay? We're not going to go through chapter by chapter, verse by verse, but I'm going to crack open the croissant and we're going to separate the judgment from the salvation, these two themes, and look at it a little bit more orderly. Uh, Because of that, uh, we'll be doing a lot of flipping around in the final five chapters. So if you want to get your finger exercise, that's great. Or you can just listen uh, to the passages as we read them. And you can always go back later by listening to the audio or video. So we're going to keep things simple today. We're going to do the KISS method. Keep it simple, saint. Uh, And in the name of keeping things simple, uh, I'm going to try to lay out the gist of these final five chapters of Isaiah in just one verse. Think we can do it? I think we can here. And if we can wrap our heads around this one verse from Isaiah, we're going to get the blueprint of where we're going. We're going to have our answer to these questions. Well, how does the story end? And to what destination is God bringing human history? And that verse says, drum roll, please. Not really. Uh, Isaiah 66, 14. If you want to turn to this one, this is a good one to turn to, though. Isaiah 66, 14, and we're actually just going to look at the second half of this verse. So really, we're getting the whole five chapters and a half of verse. Not bad. This will be the coat hanger upon which we drape the rest of the message. How does the story end? Isaiah 66, 14, the second half says, The hand of the Lord will be made known to his servants, but his fury will be shown to his foes. I'll read that one again because it's that important. The hand of the Lord will be made known to his servant, but his fury will be shown to his foes. Now, the hand of the Lord here, it means his hand of friendship, his hand of provision, his hand of mighty power that's going to rescue and redeem his people. And this open hand is contrasted with this fist of fury. So this 
is how the story of Isaiah ends. With God's comfort being extended to his friends, his wrath being extended to his foes, comfort and judgment to the very end of this book. And uh, I said that that half a verse encapsulates most of the gist of the final five chapters. The only thing I'd add to it is, is that God will be glorified uh, in the end as well. But that detail comes a few verses later. So we'll, we'll just, I'll just uh, deliver that big idea to you one more time here, and then we'll dump, jump in and look at the details here. How does the story end? In the end, God will judge his foes. He will comfort his friends, and he will be glorified throughout the earth. So let's look at this piece by piece. First point here, God will judge his foes. And like I say, there's a lot of material in the final five chapters of Isaiah. We could choose a lot of passages for this one. I'm going to choose just two, uh, and we'll make our point clear enough, I think. So let's look first, if you do want to flip with me, to Isaiah 63, verse 1. Isaiah 63, verse 1. God will judge his foes. And here's the setup for chapter 63. Not surprisingly, chapter 62 just came before it. And chapter 62 says, okay, people, this is God speaking, I'm ready to act. I'm going to send my Savior. Here he comes. And then the curtain draws open and we get chapter 63. And in chapter 63, we're given this picture of God or more likely his servant as the divine warrior. And we'll talk about what that means. But let's just read it first. Chapter 63, verse 1. Here comes your Savior. Who is this coming from Edom, from Bozrah with his garments stained crimson? Who is this robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? It is I, proclaiming victory, mighty to save. Why are your garments red like those of one treading the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone. From the nations, no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my wrath. Their blood spattered my garments, and I stained all my clothing. It was for me the day of vengeance, the year for me to redeem had come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled that no one gave support. So my own arm achieved salvation for me, and my own wrath sustained me. I trampled the nations in my anger, in my wrath. I made them drunk and poured their blood on the ground. Okay, let's stop it right there. So uh, what's going on here? Again, the setup has been, hey, here comes your Savior. And it's a conversation between someone, probably like Isaiah, and this divine warrior, Now, this is a a motif that's uh, in the Old Testament, other places in Isaiah as well. Basically, this divine warrior is either the embodiment of God or the servant of God. Um, And they say, well, look, here he is, but why is he wearing these red robes? And he asks, and he says, well, this, this is the blood of the nations. And that gives us some pause there. We go, whoa, wait a second. Is this some kind of unhinged axe murderer here? Uh, No. It says in verse 4, it was for me the day of vengeance. The year for me to redeem had come. So this is not purposeless violence. This is purposeful uh, violence to uh, right wrongs, to redeem. He's the one mighty to save. And if we have a hard time kind of thinking of God in these terms, we have to think of uh, like a a groom would protect his bride. Or maybe like a mom, like a mama bear comes out and protects her children when they are being wronged or attacked or threatened. So this is not a picture of uh, irrational or unjust or unhinged anger, but this is a desire to right a wrong and to redeem what has been lost. Evil is judged. And this turns out to be a messy business. Evil don't just lay down and beg for milk bones. And I think what's scandalous to our hearts here is we realize that in the context of Isaiah, this applies to the servant of the Lord, so to Jesus. And that might be really shocking to us. But I'll say this too, uh, the New Testament authors pick up on this, particularly in the book of Revelation. Chapter 19, the apostle John's writing He sees this vision, and there's a vision of one on a white horse wearing these red robes and going out to make war on the nations. It says in Revelation 19, he's the one who with justice he judges and makes war. And last week, I'll mention too, this is from the New Testament. 
In Luke chapter four, Jesus starts out his earthly ministry. And as he goes into the synagogue, he reads from Isaiah's scroll, chapter 61, which starts out and says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The passage continues on there and it says, and the day of vengeance of our God. It's favor and vengeance, comfort and judgment. It's both. But can our theology handle this? We have to understand our, I'm sorry, expand our understanding of God, I think, sometimes and go where Scripture leads us. It's an incomplete picture of God that just says, well, God is love and leaves it at that. Yes, it's true. God is love. We're about to study John's epistles starting next week. That's where that phrase comes from. But God, who is love, is also the same one that says about himself, I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. Likewise, and I don't know that uh, many of us here would have this view, but some might have a view of Jesus as this peace-loving hippie in a white robe going around cuddling children all the time. But the same Messiah who said, let the little children come to me, and he said that, is also the same divine warrior who will righteously someday spill the blood of his enemies in due time to redeem his own. So how does the story end? Part of the story, and it's not all of it, but part of the story is that God will judge his foes. And as grisly as this may seem, God's judgment of evil is a good thing. He doesn't let it go on. Now, uh, that was our first passage of judgment. I'll give you a shorter one here too. Uh, In the first passage of judgment, God's judging the nations. These are Gentiles. They're people considered enemies of God's people. They're considered to be unrighteous in and of themselves. But if you remember last week, Pastor Eric also talked about the unrighteous and the self-righteous in that both of these groups were lost. It wasn't just the unrighteous. It was also the self-righteous. And so it shouldn't be surprising that in these last five chapters of Isaiah, it's not just the unrighteous nations or Gentiles that God judges, but also the self-righteous who are his foes. Let's look at our second passage. This one's shorter. This is chapter 66, begin verse three. It's nice to hear the sound of pages turning. Chapter 66, verse three. And God is speaking about judgment upon the self-righteous here. 66.3, he says, Whoever sacrifices a bull is like one who kills a person. And whoever offers a lamb is like one who breaks a dog's neck. Whoever makes a grain offering is like one who presents pig's blood. And whoever burns memorial incense is like one who worships an idol. They have chosen their own ways and they delight in their abominations. So also I will, be heart, or I will choose harsh treatment for them and bring on with them what they dread. For when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, no one listened. They did evil in my sight and chose what displeases me. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your own people who hate you and exclude you because of my name have said, let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy, yet they will be put to shame. Hear that uproar from the city. Hear that noise from the temple. It is the sound of the Lord repaying his enemies what they deserve. Yikes. Whew. Spicy ending here. It does get better, so hold on with me here. This passage, it starts out talking about sacrifices, right? Sacrifices of animals, different kinds of things. These were Jewish practices, and they were right practices in and of themselves, but they were done in the wrong spirit. See in verse three how he says, they've chosen their own ways, delighted in their abominations. And the problem was, is that deep down, they disregarded God. Verse four, God says to them, when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, no one listened. They did evil in my sight and chose what displeases me. Now, when I heard this, uh, I called and no one answered. I thought of our cell phones, right? It's like, you're busy. We're all busy, right? You get a call. You look at the caller ID and go, eh, I'll let it go to voicemail, right? Just imagine if your caller ID said, the Lord God Almighty. Are you going to let that go to voicemail or are you going to pick it up, right? Sometimes we let it go to voicemail. If God really wants to get us, he'll send a text message. But what it is, is this veneer of religion that is covering up rebellious hearts that say, you know what? 
forget God. I'm going to just do it my own way. I'll just uh, give him a bull or a sheep or some other sacrifice once in a while to get him off my back. And these false worshipers, as it were, they excluded people who were really worshiping God from the heart. They kicked him out of the temple area. They made fun of them. And then the scary part for me, this is probably the most shocking verse for me out of the entire thing. I'll just say this is verse six, where he says, this is God speaking to his redeemed people about those worshiping in the temple area. He says, verse six, hear that uproar from the city. Hear that noise from the temple. It's the sound of the Lord repaying his enemies all they deserve. Yikes. Think of this, Jerusalem, city on a hill, temple area there. God's worshipers outside the city kicked out by those practicing false worship. And God's saying, can you hear the noise? That's me judging those who are going to play religion and have uh, hearts that are far from me. Whew. Bottom line here, God will judge his foes, whether they be unrighteous or self-righteous, whether they outright reject him or whether they offer just lip service to God with cold hearts. And uh, we'll do application and passing today as we go through by these different passages. Well, we say, well, how does this fact that God will judge his foes someday, how does that apply to us today? I think one thing it should make us do is to live reverently with respect for God. Do we treat God with respect? Do we treat him lightly or do we let him go to voicemail? And kind of as a corollary of that is how do we treat sin in our lives? Do we treat that lightly? We not ought not to. And I think even another application, and this is the hard one, is to look at our own hearts. Because our hearts are tricky. They try to trick us. But where uh, do we see ourselves acting in a self-righteousness that is depending on other stuff rather than a humble and obedient heart to God? Where do we adhere to a bunch of practices uh, or I'll just make it up to God by doing X, Y, or Z rather than obeying him in the moment. God will judge his foes. This is the first bit of how the story will end. And uh, I'll say right now, it's about to get a little easier here. So whew, everyone breathe. The second part here of how the story ends is a little bit more encouraging. Uh, our question again is, how does the story end? To what destination is God bringing human history? One where God's enemies will be judged, but also one where God will comfort his friends. Okay. Ha, ah, that sounds good. Let's talk about that. And again, uh, the last five chapters of Isaiah are so thick. We could choose multiple passages here. I'm just going to choose two to look at. One is kind of iconic. You've probably heard it before. Second one is not so iconic, but it's short. So that's good, right? Let's look at the, the longer one that's a little bit uh, more famous. Isaiah 65, verse 17 is where we'll start. Isaiah 65, 17. This is the good stuff. This is God speaking to his redeemed people. And he says in Isaiah 65, 17, he says, See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. Ooh, sounds good. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I'll create. For I'll create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I'll rejoice over Jerusalem. Take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They'll build houses and dwell in them. They'll plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people." My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They won't labor in vain. They won't bear children doomed to misfortune. They will be a people blessed by the Lord and they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I'll answer. While they're still speaking, I will hear. And this last part's probably the most famous. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Okay, good passage, okay? It gets better. And if you heard in that, you probably heard a lot of echoes of the final chapters of Revelation. There's this huge overlap, really, uh, in a lot of the kind of themes and motifs in the end of Isaiah in the final chapters of Revelation. New heavens, new earth, no more tears. 
the divine warrior in the red robe, and there are more. Uh, but what we're looking at here is this is the vision that God gives to Isaiah as this view of the future. And uh, getting a little technical here for a minute, those of you who like to look under the hood with theology, you say, well, which future? Is this the millennium? Is this the eternal state? Are these both kind of mashed together? I'll say, it's a great question to ask over coffee. I'll be glad to go with you and talk about that. We don't have time to kind of uh, unpack that all now. But I will say that um, we're going to keep it simple. Uh, keep it simple, saint, and uh, call it the vision of the future. The basic idea here is that God is creating a new heavens and a new earth. They're different from what we know now uh, and better, but they're told to us in terms, uh, in ways that we can kind of get a glimpse of it and kind of understand it. I'll just go over some of the highlights here. Verse 18, he says, I'll create Jerusalem, this place to be delight and its people a joy. Great place, great people. Aren't you glad you don't have to choose one or the other? Uh, I'd probably choose the great people. Uh, but uh, you get both. Great place, great people. Verse 19, I will rejoice over Jerusalem. Think of the weight and the beauty of that. And take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard no more. Things are going to be good with God. What a relief. How much peace uh, will come to us because of that. And uh, he talks about no more weeping and crying. And then he goes into detail and says, well, I'm going to remove the reasons for a lot of the weeping and crying here. Premature death, unproductive work. Uh, the work's going to be rewarding and rich. Verse 24, it says, uh, there's going to be some intimacy with God. He says, before they call, I'll answer. Where they're still speaking, I will hear. Uh, it's like a picture of no more delayed prayers, uh, but this open and clear communication with God. And then verse 25 uh, kind of bringing it home here. He says, the wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The dust will be the serpent's food and they will neither harm nor destroy in all my holy mountain. This is that picture of peace, shalom, nature restored, not violent, not dangerous, but good. So that's the first one. Uh, the second one, uh, another passage about God's comfort of his friends. It's not so long. Uh, but it has to do with a sudden restoration of Jerusalem. And uh, we're not going to read all of it. I'm just going to read the, the tail end of it. But this suddenness with which God says he's about to act is encouraging in itself because, man, don't you feel like sometimes you just wait forever in a certain season of life? Uh, and then God will bring one of his suddenlies and kind of break you out of that for the good. This is one of God's suddenlies. We're going to kind of catch it up on the back end of it in Isaiah 66. Verse 12, Isaiah 66, 12. God's restoring the fortunes of Jerusalem. And he says, this is what the Lord says. I will extend peace to her, meaning Jerusalem, like a river. In the wealth of the nations, like flooding stream, you'll nurse and be carried on her arm and dandled on her knees. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. And you will be comforted over Jerusalem. When you see this, your heart will rejoice and you will flourish like grass. Pause. And then we come back full circle to that verse we started with, 6614. The hand of the Lord will be made known to his servants, but his fury will be shown to his foes. It's judgment and comfort. Hand in hand, layers of the croissant. But the focus, the part that we're focusing on here has to deal with God's comfort of his friends. I think uh, about uh, applications for us here and now, uh, again. And I think um, that this promise of God's comfort should give us a real hope uh, and thankfulness as we live our lives down here in the fog. Uh, for me personally, this has been the biggest challenge. I think the past few weeks as I've been going through these verses here, uh, is realizing, man, I'm, I'm forgetting the bigger picture that I can have hope uh, beyond 2020, beyond the craziness in our nation. Um, I can have hope because of what God is doing and where we're going. Uh, the clock keeps on ticking. Somehow we all made it through 2020. 2021 might be a wild ride as well. Uh, but there is a bigger picture of where God is drawing humanity uh, of where he's going towards his glory, and you and I get to be a part of what he's doing here. And this bigger picture transcends our politics. It transcends our stances on things we get so focused on down here. 
We live in the fog of war, but when God acts, the fog will lift. Enemies, evil will be judged. Uh, We'll be reunited with God and it will be really, really good. We will be comforted. This is the place where God is bringing humanity. It should give us a reverence for him. It should give us this hope and expectation. It should give us thankfulness for the good he's brought in our lives. And uh, before we hit our last point of how the story ends, I do want to hit one very important side note here. Now that we've looked at this difference between God's friends and his foes, rebels and servants, and the thing I want to just really quickly address here is, well, what's the difference between God's friends and his foes? Or if you want to put put it this way, if you're a rebel, an enemy of God, how do you change your stripes and become a friend of God? How do you become his servant? Let's real quickly look at Isaiah 66, verse 1. Isaiah 66, 1. This is what the Lord says. Heaven's my throne, earth's my footstool. Where's the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things so they came into being, declares the Lord? These are the ones I look on with favor. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit and you tremble in my word. Okay, let's pause right there. Okay, God's uh, starting out here, he says, basically he says, hey, I made the heavens, I made the earth. And you think you're gonna build a temple for me? He's like, get real, okay? I mean, that's the gist of it here, really. He's like, I made everything. There's nothing you can give me that I haven't already given you first. And he says, in light of that, uh, this is what I really want from you. In verse two, he says, those who are humble, contrite in spirit, and those who tremble at my word. The humble part is the realization, yeah, we can't give anything to God. We can't build him a temple. We can't do good works. We can't do anything apart from what he's given us. The contrition there, the contrite heart, it's a broken spirit. It's a realization that we are all deserving of God's wrath, although he offers us a better path in his servant. And the tremble at my word part is to seriously consider God. Don't send him to voicemail, right? Uh, But to be ready to uh, live for him and obey him. Now, in the larger context of Isaiah, uh, beyond just our five chapters here, these are the people, the friends. They're not trying to be righteous before God by their works, by building temples and doing the rest. And there's actually a list that follows this passage. But they're trusting in the sacrifice of the suffering servant from chapters 52 and 53 that Mark, Pastor Mark preached on a few weeks back. Just to remind us, Isaiah 53, uh, verse 5, tells us about this servant, uh, He says, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's this transaction thing. Do you see it's the he and the we? There's this exchange that's taking place here. We know from the bigger picture of Scripture that the suffering servant of Isaiah is Jesus. He died on the cross as our substitute. He paid for our sins, and then he rose from the dead. And the one that God esteems is the one who knows that we can't build a temple or do anything else on our own to save ourselves. But we need to humbly accept God's sacrifice, this exchange for us, the righteous servant for us. And in gratitude, in response to that sacrifice, we tremble at God's word. We're ready to obey, not an obedience that saves us, but an obedience that shows that our hearts have been affected by what he's done for us. And if you've never put your trust in Jesus, if you've never made that exchange, uh, we'll give you a chance to at the end, when I pray in a minute, uh, you can go from being God's foe to his friend, You can go from being a rebel against him to being his servant uh, when we pray. Uh, But first, I want to just wrap up with our last point here. How does the story end? God will judge his foes. He will comfort his friends. And God will use both rebels and servants for his glory. Keyword glory right there. Let's look at this last passage. This is Isaiah 66, 15. A little bit longer, we'll read from 66, 15 all the way to the end of the book. Um, and then we'll digest it a little bit here. 
So see the Lord's coming with fire and his chariots are like a whirlwind. He will bring down his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For with fire and with his sword, the Lord will execute judgment on all people and many will be those slain by the Lord. Those who consecrate and purify themselves to go into the gardens, following one who is among those who eat the flesh of pigs, rats, and other clean things, they'll meet their end together with the one they follow, declares the Lord. And I, because of what they have planned and done, I'm about to come and gather the people of all nations and languages, and they will come and see my glory. I'll set a sign among them, and I'll send some of those who survived to the nations, to Tarshish, to the Libyans and Lydians, famous as archers, to Tubal and Greece, and to the distant lands, distant islands, read Alaska, that have not heard of my fame or seen my glory. They will proclaim my glory among the nations. And they will bring all your people from all the nations to my holy mountain in Jerusalem as an offering to the Lord. On horses, chariots, wagons, mules, camels, says the Lord. They will bring them as the Israelites bring their grain offerings to the temple of the Lord in ceremonially clean vessels. And I'll select some of them also to be priests and Levites, says the Lord. As the new heavens and earth, a new earth that I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another. All mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord. And they will go out and look on the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will not die. The fire that burns them will not be quenched. And they will be loathsome to all mankind. Okay. Final part of Isaiah, final verses of Isaiah, starts with another judgment passage against those who are practicing false worship uh, to another God, basically. And verse 18 says, well, because of this, because of this false worship system, uh, I'm going to respond and I'm going to gather everyone to myself so they see my glory. So God sends out some of his servants as messengers. This is like missionaries, uh, like uh, the Great Commission. Uh, the nations respond, they come in, they give glory to God, and some of these become priests and Levites, basically people who are giving God more glory. And this is happening even now in the New Testament with us. God's glory, word of his uh, greatness is spreading to all the world. People are coming to know him, and people are serving him for his glory. But the final picture we're left with here, on one hand, it's the nations coming in to glorify God, but it's also the redeemed servants looking out on the dead bodies of the rebels. Judgment and comfort to the very last verse of this book. Both rebels and servants will give God glory. Servants will do it by telling others about God, by serving as his ministers, and the rebels by provoking God to act, verse 18, but also as serving as this counter example of God's mercy, an everlasting testimony to the holiness of God and his righteous judgment. Both rebels and servants will be used by God for his glory, but in different ways, as displays of mercy and grace or as displays of his judgment. And a very sobering question hits us, well, which one would we rather be? Isaiah ends here uh, on a sober note. And you can say, well, hey, how did that book of Isaiah end up? Is it a happy ending? Well, yes, but this is not exactly the Ewoks having a party on the moon forest planet of Endor, right? Uh, this is a more sober picture of the redeemed, uh, those who are saved by grace, by a holy God and worshiping him, but also looking out on what could have been on those who rebelled against God. This is the kind of ending uh, that humbles us as people, but glorifies God. It's not the kind of ending where we go, hey, we won, yay! But it's the kind where we go, he won, and man, we are blessed to be a part of that. Uh, and the application point, I think, for us and seeing how this is all working for God's glory is to, is to realize uh, our lives uh, are not really ultimately about us, but about God in his glory. How will our lives today reflect his glory? So that's uh, our big picture view of how the story ends. 
uh, where God is leading all humanity. God will judge his foes, comfort his friends, and be glorified throughout the earth. Uh, and as we drop below the clouds again this week into our normal fog of war, hello, family, hello, work, hello, Facebook, we need to remember the big picture of where God is bringing us uh, because that's going to give us steel in our soul that's going to carry us through good times and rough times and help us to live purposefully. Uh, so as we go this week, let's think about how God might be calling us to live more reverently or hopefully or with thankfulness or with humble obedience as we work for his glory right where he's placed us. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you that you are um, doing something in human history that's purposeful, meaningful, and uh, just fabulous. Uh, thanks for letting us be a part of that. It's a very humbling thing. Lord, I pray for uh, those here who haven't yet put their trust in you, who uh, feel like they've been sending you to voicemail, putting you on the back burner or outright just uh, standing against you, but who want to become your friends. I, I pray for them. And if that's you right now, just pray something like this along your own hearts. It doesn't have to be word for word, but just say this in your heart to God and say, God, I'm sorry um, for putting you on the back burner, for ignoring you and for trying to be my own boss. I don't want to keep on going that way, but I want you to be my boss. I know there's no temple I could build, no work I could do to earn my way before you, but I humbly accept this sacrifice you've made for me, that your servant, Jesus Christ, lived a righteous life uh, and died in my place as my substitute on the cross. And he rose again from the dead. And I trust in what he has done and that sacrifice before you. Help me to walk it out with you. And if you've prayed that, uh, come tell me, tell Pastor Eric, tell Pastor Mark, one of the elders, I was going to help you grow in that. And Lord, uh, for those of us who have already done that, Help us to hold this big picture of where we're going in our hearts this week as we go back into workplaces and family situations and all sorts of craziness down in the fog of war that we might glorify you and be encouraged as we do it. For your glory, Jesus, we pray. Amen.